but I'm also extremely exhausted today, so I think I'll be relying a little more heavily on my notes, and I hope I will remain relatively coherent. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk to you today about sensory processing because, see, it's time for my notes already, sensory processing issues are really common for autistic people, and um, they are now considered part of the diagnostic process, one of the two categories that is looked at when making an autism diagnosis. Um, what am I saying? Stim, stim. Um, <laughs> this is how it gets real. This is what it's really like. This is what's hard when this happens to me in a public place. Uh, when my brain is just not working. Um, anyway, okay, <laughs> autism diagnosis is based on communication difficulties, and that is the first category that is looked at, and the second category that is looked at when making an autism diagnosis is sensory processing issues lumped together with what is called rigid and repetitive behaviors. So I've already talked about stimming, which is short for self-stimulating or stimulatory behavior, which is generally a coping mechanism autistic people use. And it's connected to sensory processing issues because sensory processing issues often cause distress, which leads to stimming, or an individual can be seeking sensory input because they, they don't process it enough to feel um, satisfied with the level of natural sensory input that comes in, so they seek sensory input. Um, so basically, in, under the category of sensory input, we have the individual experiencing understimulation and overstimulation. Um, so what I'm going to try and do today is share with you my experiences with sensory input and what I find very difficult and where I seek sensory issues. I'm more of an avoider than a seeker, but I do have a mix of traits and I think pretty much most autistic people do have a mix. Um, I'm hoping this video doesn't turn into a, something that sounds like a pity party. I don't intend it to be. I just intend it to be real and honest. And that means I am going to tell you about things that I normally don't reveal. Um, senses, of course, if you think about what the, the five senses include, um, taste and touch and, and sight and smell and sound, um, there's an aspect of intimacy in some of our sensory experiences, and so uh, there are some boundaries I'm not going to cross and some things I'm not going to talk about because they're too personal. But um, before I launch into explaining some of my experiences, I just want to make sure that um, that you're understanding what I mean when I say, use the term masking. Masking is the term used to identify behaviors that are coping strategies and hiding strategies. So an autistic person who masks is an autistic person who has figured out that some or all of their behaviors are not socially acceptable or they won't fit in or they won't fly under the radar or they may experience negative consequences if they show certain types of typically autistic behaviors. So masking is essentially suppressing those behaviors. Um, it's exhausting. And people like me who have gone most of their life not knowing they're autistic have, do tend to be heavy maskers, to use masking strategies a lot because we don't know what the heck is going on with ourselves. So we're trying to cover up hide it and um, it contributes to burnout at a certain stage in life when you're just exhausted from doing this but it's also very difficult to let go of the masking I'm attempting to do that and making videos is part of my strategy for doing that but sensory processing issues can be distressing for the autistic person and yet the the um, the sensory input 
is not distressing or possibly not even registering for the other people in the environment. So there's a risk of being judged as weird or a drama queen or attention seeking or annoying if you reveal your difficulty with certain sensory experiences. So again, that's the reason for masking. Um, I have literally gotten through a lot of life by gritting my teeth and tensing my body and just attempting to cope. And as you can imagine, this has actually led to physical symptoms of fatigue and pain. And um, massage sounds like it would be a good idea, but I have difficulty with that for two reasons. One is I have difficulty being touched by strangers. And the other is I have difficulty regularly attending appointments. So massage doesn't work out that well for me, even though it seems like it would be ideal for deal. You can even see now I'm doing this. I think I'm probably subconsciously trying to stop myself from rocking, which means I'm, I'm tight, tightening everything up. So um, before I launch into listing or describing some of my personal challenges, I'm going to attempt to read for you a poem I wrote uh, a little while ago after a shopping experience. And I am probably not going to look at the camera while I read this. This is called A Shopping Trip in My Hometown. I learned to cope by gritting my teeth, tensing my body and charging forward. Get in, get it done, get home again with the prize. I enjoy something new as much as the next person. Some things I need, whether I like them or not. Clothing. I don't love shopping for clothes. I love being clothed in soft, comfortable fabric. My favorite colors, a flexible body armor. It may look just like an outfit to you, but it's a sanctuary. I walk between the racks, scanning for the right colors amongst all the black and gray. I touch, run my hand along the edges, the sleeves, stroke the fabric. Is it soft enough? Sequins and logos and rips are not acceptable. I read the label. What is it made of? Five minutes in, maybe less, the bright fluorescent lights and the ear-stabbing sounds of canned music are too much. It's a conscious effort to ignore. No, tolerate them. About as easy as ignoring fish taking bites of you while you swim. Keep going. It will soon be over. Swim to the back of the store. Fifteen items in a cart. Breathe. Only ten at a time in the change room. I know the procedure. Sort logically. All tops together. All pants together. Deep breath again. Leave some in the cart. Damn it. Why didn't I wear socks? I have to take my boots off and bare feet on the change room floor. The things I feel underfoot. What are they? Sticker from the crotch of a bathing suit. Hygiene barrier now stuck to the floor. A billion tiny hard things. Remember to dress again properly. You've usually got the hood of your jacket tucked under the collar. Items in left hand are for keeps. Tell the attendant some worked and some didn't. Why are shop lights so bright? It hurts, the sharp green light. Too much of it. Wrong color. The wrongness of the lighting always sneaks up on me. But the second I enter a store, what I notice is how it smells. Old and musty, dirty and greasy. Unwashed fridge with old vegetables and spilled milk. A mixture of industrial chemicals like cleaners and glues and synthetic carpet, rubber tires or plastic things from China. I will name you Canadian Tire, Target, Walmart, Body Shop, Lush, Crabtree and Evelyn, no less overwhelming than a bottle of 1980s opium perfume. I like the smells of Edible Island, raisins and spices, fair trade chocolate, tea and beans and rice, hippie food meat that hasn't been tortured. I want to shop there more. Do they play music in there? I think so, but it's just right. Not noise added to cacophony, no needles or hammers, no loudspeakers squeal and squawk. A voice reaching out to squeeze my brain in a fist. No need to clap my hands over my ears. I didn't used to let my distress show, or at least I don't think I did, but of course I don't see my own face. I made an effort to hide it, to not be weird. Now, I cover my ears often, and I duck slightly, cowering when I feel assaulted. There are bodies to avoid, obstacles I should not crash into, brain and body using different operating systems. Concentrate hard, 
Speak to some people. It's okay. Friendly exchanges can be enjoyable, though effortful. It would be easier not to have to. Smile. It will get you through. Your brain will believe it. Still, the checkout to navigate. Chat with the cashier. Will I say something stupid? Shouldn't matter. Just be me. Cover everything with a laugh. Home. I can't get coat and boots off fast enough. Drop my purse and bags on the floor. Collapse on the bed. A safe sanctuary. Grab the weighted blanket. Will I read? Look at pictures and sort colors? Which will soothe me? Bed. I will still be there tomorrow. Well, <laughs> it's a rough draft, but, um, yeah, that was a, a true experience of what it's like for me to be out and shopping and how I have to almost self-coach, talk my way through it, remind myself what my skills are, remind myself what the goal is, that I can get there, walk myself through the stages, and, uh, and then come home and collapse. So, um, childhood, my childhood. Um, of course, I wasn't diagnosed, and I did have some obvious signs of sensory processing challenges, and my mother's memory combined with my own gives me at least a short list here that I can share with you. Um, I hated being bathed and having my hair washed. Um, I've read that it's quite popular, popular, that's the wrong word, quite typical for autistic people to dislike their heads being touched. So hair washing is um, quite, quite typically something that small children object to. And according to my mother, I screamed blue murder. So, um, yeah, water, having my hair touched, being bathed, I didn't like. I liked to be held very tightly right from birth, and so I used to cry in order to be picked up and held tightly, but only by my parents. I didn't like to go to anybody else. I was very jumpy with loud noises right from the start, and I had a strong attraction to certain tactile experiences. I can remember having favorite objects that I would carry around, um, just because I liked them and quite often I liked the way they felt and I wanted to just feel them over and over again. I spent a lot of time closely examining things um, out in the garden just you know, squatting down and examining a bug in a flower but one of the things I didn't do which is actually a, a sign of autism although we didn't know this uh, at the time, my parents didn't know this, I didn't generally bring anything to their attention. I didn't go and get them to come and see something or pick something and take it to them and say, look, look at this. I was really kind of in my own world experiencing things and experiencing my sensory environment. Um, I did pick at things and I remember there was some wallpaper in my bedroom which um, hadn't quite been applied. I keep doing this hadn't quite been applied properly and so it wasn't tight into the corner and I used to lie in my bed and take my thumbnail and run it up and down in that that corner and slit the wallpaper and I just loved the way that felt I really loved doing that uh, I don't think I confessed to doing that until about 20 years ago um, I was a bit of a seeker of sensory input for the vestibulary system, which is the sense of balance. So I did like to dance and jump around and spin. I taught myself to do cartwheels. I had a pogo stick, which I loved. Um, but I was also clumsy. Uh, some of the favorite childhood stories are of me having accidents, like learning to ride my bike um, there I am in an enormous field, riding on grass. I should be nice and safe. Dad's running behind me, holding the back of the seat. Sorry, my cat's squawking. Come here. Running. <laughs> Dad's running behind me. He decides to let go, and I head straight for the only goalpost in the entire field and crash right into it. Um, learning to roller skate. I think I fell in the rose bushes. I fell a lot. I wore a lot of band-aids on my knees and elbows. Um, but I was 
basically happy jumping around and spinning. I love the swings. When I went to a playground, the only thing I did was the swing. Um, although I fell off the swings, I think I jumped actually and landed on my face on a rock and knocked out my two front teeth. So uh, yeah, that's my childhood. Okay, <laughs> now I'm all grown up and uh, I'm just going to go through different sensory experiences and share with you what it's like for me. I don't know how successfully I can get across how difficult some of these situations are because it's difficult to explain something to somebody who doesn't experience it. Um, probably one of my biggest challenges is noise and it's it can be loudness but it can also be pitch, um, consistent droning, um, yeah, there's more to it than just the volume, although volume is certainly annoying. But we live in a world full of power tools now, and so I would say power tools intrude in my life almost daily, even when I'm at home. Vehicles without mufflers, motorcycles that are the noisy variety. Uh, sorry, all you Harley Davidson riders, I probably hate you. Um, sirens. But my own clanging and banging around the house too, because like I keep mentioning, I'm a bit clumsy, um, which I think is um, <laughs> an autistic trait, also a bit of an ADHD trait. So when I'm in the kitchen putting away dishes, I am clanging and banging and then um, <laughs> cringing at the noises I'm making myself. So then I try to do it quickly to get it over with and that's kind of a recipe for disaster very low humming noises that appliances make and living in an apartment building sometimes I can hear the ones that are in the neighbors below or beside me just this droning sound of a dryer or something like that and it's it's like it hurts it's very hard to explain why but um, something hurts there's loud music everywhere and much more than there used to be. It just seems to be the thing now that if you run a shop or a restaurant or a cafe, loud music needs to be played. And that's often being combined with voices and possibly machinery like cafes constantly have the, um, I don't even know what they are, frappe machines, the, the, the cappuccino machines, whatever they are. Um, they make a lot of noise and they're constant and it's worse in the summer when people are ordering more blended drinks and ice drinks because then there's more use of the Vitamix or whatever it is. Um, those are really hard for me to cope with and my understanding of what's going on for an autistic person with sensory processing disorder is not just that it's too loud but that the brain is having difficulties processing the incoming sounds and sorting things out and prioritizing some and allowing others to blend into the background. So it can be very difficult to be social in a situation like that because I have to work very hard to filter out all of the other noises and concentrate on what the people speaking are saying and hear that and not hear everything else with equal priority. And um, of course, ADHD gets in the way there too. Um, so being in a city is really hard for me. Uh, I guess I was lucky because I grew up in a small town, which even though it's not as small now as it used to be, um, still compared to a city, it's not as bad. And certainly my childhood version of where I grew up was a pretty quiet place. And so it took a while, it took until I think I was really in my 20s before I was aware that daily noises were causing anxiety and difficult for me. Recently, I was in a situation where I was in a garage and I have problems with smells. I'll get to that in a minute too. And, and the types of smells you find in a garage tend to be really difficult for me. They make me feel sick. So I was coping with the smells and for some reason, the 
the voice of the person who was doing most of the speaking and the slight echo in the environment was creating an effect that felt like my ears were being stabbed by knives. And obviously nobody else is having this experience, so I don't want to say anything. I don't want to be rude or offend someone. I'm accustomed to just coping and you know, not prioritizing my own needs. And so I just got through it. But it is, it is my goal to get a little bit better at um, self-advocacy and remove myself from situations like that and uh, consider my own comfort before I worry about whether or not it's rude or offensive to the other person. Got to do a little bit of um, battling my upbringing there. Okay, so smell. I mentioned smells in the garage. For me, smells that are difficult, I, I call them petrochemical. I'm not sure if I'm correct in that terminology, but petrochemical, cleaning, industrial chemical, fuel smells, rubbers and plastics, those are really hard for me. And so I, I struggle in places like Canadian Tire or garages with um, the smell of rubber tires. And uh, generally it gives me a feeling of nausea. Um, pot, <laughs> I've mentioned that before. I hate the smell of pot, it makes me feel sick. Cigarettes, artificial fragrances, sometimes the smell of cooking meat. Um, and the smell of people, that's difficult. I can smell people and it feels uncomfortably too intimate. Um, I can smell myself sometimes and I don't know if that's just my overdeveloped sense of smell or should I worry that other people can smell me and <laughs> that gets a little weird and stressful. Um, okay, touch and texture. That's another big one for me. I've mentioned stimming by soft fabrics, and certainly I'm a sensory seeker when it comes to touch, but I'm also an avoider. Doesn't my cat sound funny? She's a beautiful cat with a hideous voice. Um, so textures that I dislike are often in food, and food aversions are more likely to be texture than actual flavor. And I do struggle with meat sometimes, and I've been vegetarian more than once in my life simply because I get to a point where I cannot handle the smell and the texture of meat and tendons and fat and bones and gristle and ugh. Um, I don't really like gentle touch, which is um, you know usually what you do when you're intimate, when you're being affectionate with someone you care about, you cuddle a baby, you know you might stroke them gently. Um, gentle touch is, I don't even know how to explain it, it's just awful, it's really hard to endure. Um, whereas I do like firm touch, firm pressure, that's fine. Um, clothing, soft clothing I like, but I also like it to be tight, not restrictive tight, but kind of like spandex tight, though the spandex has to be mixed with a lot of natural materials. Um, maybe I'd like living in a Star Trek uniform, Starfleet uniform. Um, <laughs> I think I'm the only female I know who actually likes wearing tights, but there's something about having the clothing snug against my body, as well as doing up my shoelaces really tightly. I like my shoes to be either buckled on or strapped on, tied on, and if I have to stop and tie up one shoelace, I will redo the other because I have to make the tightness on each foot feel matched. Um, I can also be somewhat oblivious to to touch or, I don't know, my sense of, of touch is a little off and so I'm not aware of things. I think it took me until about 10 years ago to actually wear cardigans properly because I wore them to keep myself warm. And so I would pull them up and I'd have the collar way up high and the cardigan would be all kind of out of line and yeah, it just wasn't stylish. <laughs> well, cardigans aren't stylish anyway, but it was all about being warm and comfortable for me, not about what it looked like until I think I saw a photo of myself and I thought, whoa, <laughs> you're not putting your clothes on properly. And I tend to miss things like 
you know, the hood will be tucked under or something like that. And I don't feel it, I guess, because it's soft. It's not scratch. Why do I keep doing this? This is annoying me. I hope it's not annoying you. Um, it's not scratchy. So I guess that's why I don't notice it. Um, I also like loose layers on top of the firm tight clothing. So I'm prone to buying clothing in sizes that are too big for me because that's my idea of what feels good. Um, yeah. And I've mentioned my weighted blanket. So that's again, a sensory issue with touch where I'm enjoying pressure and um, weight. And then I'd have troubles being touched by strangers. And by strangers, I basically mean doctors, dentists, and hairstylists. Um, because at that point, the way they're touching you is kind of intimate, but they are strangers. Whereas I could be walking down the street and give a very quick, spontaneous hug to a complete stranger and it won't bother me because it's firm pressure and it's quick and it's over with. But I, qu I can't look into the eyes and gently touch for prolonged periods of time. Um, most people. Uh, I think Jim's the only person who can. <laughs> okay. Um, also with touch, I am prone to chopping off all my own hair. And I don't mean just going to the hair salon to get a pixie cut, which I've tried to use as an improvement, but I mean going to the bathroom and cutting off my own hair quite a lot. And there are two sensory issues going on in there. One is that I will get to a point where the feel of hair on my head is really uncomfortable. I can't stand it. I want it off like I would like to be bald. Um, and then there's something that I actually like about the feel of cutting hair. So I like to do it. So get those two things combined and um, yeah, I'm prone to um, chopping it all off. Um, Oh, and the other thing that was a fairly recent realization is that my sensory issues are have an impact on my art. They've dictated my painting style because I like the feel of a large paintbrush thickly loaded with paint and wet paint and really just, you know, swooping and smearing it all around. Um, Whereas when I first started painting, I actually started with watercolors and I was doing the, the watercolor process, which is quite a bit um, sort of, it's very technique oriented and you have to be willing to wait for something to dry, to slowly build up layers. And, and um, I just wanted to get right in there and do stuff with the paint. So that really led to my own painting style. And then also affecting my painting style is my um, visual processing issues, which have to do with color and light. Color for me is a passion and I guess in some ways it's a visual stim or a um, what is it, cat hair. Um, a seeking of sensory input. I love to look at colors, color combinations, just play with colors. So I love to do that when I'm painting. Um, but I'm also affected by colors I dislike and color combinations I dislike. And if I have to spend a, a long period of time in a room painted a color I dislike, it really affects my mood. Um, yeah, anyway. And bright lights, um, which is, and I, I don't know anybody who really likes bright lights. So it's more about them actually causing discomfort or pain. And I find that I'm slow to notice that one. Uh, um, I'll think to myself, why do I feel so awful? And then I realize that I'm in an environment with bright lights or flashing lights or fluorescent lights. And fluorescent lights are bad, not only because they can be flickery, but because of the weird greenish color and, um, and because they have a tendency to hum. So those are particularly awful. And then the vestibular system, which I mentioned earlier, I am quite prone to motion sickness. I get motion sick quite easily and I can't even watch 3D movies without getting motion sick. And I'm quite clumsy and I have a very poor sense of where my body is in space and time. Um, 
I have always described myself as somebody whose body and brain were never in the same place. And I think that that has a lot to do with ADHD, but there is a vestibular issue in there as well. I walk into walls. I don't go through doorways very successfully without bashing into the corners and the edges. Um, I make, I, I sort of barge into spaces that I think I can fit into only to discover that I can't. So sometimes I end up bumping past people and I didn't mean to bump into them or bump past them. Um, I just thought that I fit through that space. Um, and, uh, Here's a little story for you. When I was about three, I think, um, my family got a kitten. And I was so in love with this kitten, which isn't surprising because it was soft and fluffy. I wanted to be close to it, but I kept sitting on it. So my mom gave the kitten away to my grandma and, um, Well, I still have kittens, but I don't sit on them anymore, as you can see. I, I know how to sit beside my cat, not on my cat. Um, okay, this is a longer and ramblier video than I've made so far. I'm nearly done. I just wanted to finish off with the thought that with sensory processing issues, fight, flight, or freeze impulses are triggered in me constantly on a near daily basis. Uh, the only way to avoid them is to pretty much stay in bed wearing earplugs or sleeping. Um, so given that, is it any wonder that I stay home? And is it any wonder that I struggle with anxiety and depression as well? Because living involves constant daily assault. Anyway, that's the end of the pity party and my intention was for this to help in terms of recognizing symptoms or traits in others or yourself or just having a better understanding of what life in an autistic body is like. Thanks for joining me. Um, if you liked it, please give me a thumbs up and consider subscribing. Hit the red subscribe button and I'm currently still uploading twice a week. But I don't know that that will last forever. It's a little bit tricky. But um, for now, that's the goal. And I will see you next time. Please leave me a comment or ask a question. I'm thrilled to communicate with you.